simply no precedent out there is in some ways even more abstract than this world of metaphor. And it could be summarized here in this way, which is this human ability in some settings to gain the strength and the will to do something from the irrefutable evidence that that something cannot be. What do I mean by that? Let me make this a little bit less abstract and instead a quote from Kierkegaard. And if you subscribe to this particular type of belief system, this notion that what religiosity is often about is the ability to hold two contradictory facts in your head at the same time or two contradictory beliefs. Let me make it a little bit less abstract than that. This is a nun named Sister Helen Prejean, and lots of people probably saw the movie back when Dead Man Walking, which was about her. This is a nun who has spent her time ministering to the needs of men on, a, on death row in a maximal security prison somewhere down in the south. And inevitably, she is in, asked by all sorts of people when hearing she has spent her life solacing these terrifying, evil creatures who are as damaging as any humans can be, saying, how can you do this? How can you have just spent your whole life doing this? And she always has the same answer. The less forgivable the fact, the less forgivable what the person has done, the more we must find the means to forgive them. The less lovable the person is, the more we must find the means to love them. And as a strident atheist, this strikes me as one of the most irrational, nutty, magnificent things we are capable of as a species. The more something cannot be, the more we have to make sure it is. And to finish up here, in lots of ways, that is the realm where we can do our most uniquely human things, built out of a danger of a certain human wisdom. You sit there and you look at enough about what's going on in the world and you learn enough about it and you become wise about it and there's almost an inevitable conclusion that you have to reach which is none of us can make things better because we're too small and they're too big and they're too powerful and it's not going to matter anyway and none of us can make things change. And what we have to deal with is the notion that the more clearly, irrefutably, and arguably it's the case that you cannot make a difference, the more that must be the motivation to make a difference and have that as a moral imperative. So at the end of the day, we do smelly stuff just like hamsters, and we do strange things with our stress hormones. But at the end of the day, this realm of being able to take abstractions and turn metaphors into things as powerful as the most visceral of sensory effects, and to do all of this in a context of moral imperatives, we are an entirely different planet from other species. Our ability to constantly confuse the real with the metaphorical parentheses, our brain's evolutionary challenge to have come up with something as novel as moral abstractions and have to duct tape it into some part of the brain that lizards use, and the ability for us to flip back and forth, and the ability to build entire worlds of good or bad acts out of that. Uh, how is that different from the realms of philosophy or religion? Well, depending on your tastes, that's not different in the slightest, or it's a completely different way of thinking about it. It's obviously part of that. When you have a nun saying things like, my central credo is the less lovable someone is, the more I must find the means to love them, that is at the centerpiece of that style of thinking. And as shown there, it could be framed theologically, and as shown in lots of other cases, it need not be. Uh, and one final uh, question would be, how can all of that be cultivated? Well, that's... <laughs> I don't know. I'm, Come on. <laughs> I'm just a professor. I don't know. Let's see. I think for starters, it suggests we should give tubercular meat to all of the aggressive males on this planet. 